Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part three of the solar energy segment. In part three we will discuss thermoelectrics and general feasibility of solar energy use in the US. In this third part of the solar energy segment, I want to discuss thermoelectric generators. This is a way to utilize the infrared part of the solar spectrum. We see here the solar spectrum schematically. This is the high energy ultraviolet end and here is the infrared low energy end and photovoltaics you know that now because of the band gap of semiconductors they cut off at some point so there are always some low energy photons that go through unabsorbed and these photons they can be used in thermoelectric devices which could capture a significant part of the energy that is in the solar spectrum and that we are missing out uh, if we just use solar cells. So there is a push to combine photovoltaic and thermoelectric cells into one device to capture the energy in the entire spectrum. Here's a schematic of the general concept of such a combination. The uh, sunlight is focused with a lens and then the wavelengths are separated. We pass the infrared light to the thermoelectric generator and the visible and UV light to a solar cell. It is useful to concentrate the sunlight because thermoelectric generators, like all machines that convert heat into work, benefits from a large difference between the hot and the cool end. This, as you know, increases the efficiency of such a converter. If we want to understand the ins and outs of thermovoltaic generators, we need to understand the physical basics. There is an interesting phenomenon that one can observe. If we make a circuit from two wires that are made from two different conductive materials, material A and material B, so if we solder them together in this fashion and then keep the solder points at different temperatures, so let's say we make this one hot and this one cold, then we can measure a current that flows in the circuit. From an energy point of view, this here is a heat engine. We have again a hot reservoir. You may remember this little diagram from the energy basics segment. So we have a hot source and a cold sink and the heat engine now produces some work, some useful work. And a regular heat engine that is turning the generator and making electricity. In this case, we get electrons pushed through the circuit. But in this process, we also have to maintain the other end at a cold temperature. And this is the same here. So there is always some energy flow from the hot reservoir into the cold reservoir. And in this process, a little bit of this energy is transformed to work. And that gives us this current. So we could put a load in here in the circuit and then work would be performed in this load. If we just have the wires, then these wires would heat up and that would be the work that uh, would be performed on these wires. If we cut the circuit, like down here, the electrons will still be pushed, but the current cannot flow in a circle anymore. So what we get is we have an accumulation of negative charge here and a lack of electrons here, so this turns positive. And of course, this is a voltage that we can measure if we put an, a, a voltmeter in between. This voltage is called thermovoltage, and it is essentially dependent on the temperature difference between the hot and the cold reservoir. This is the phenomenon that is used in so-called thermocouples to read out the temperature. So if you have a device that has a digital temperature readout, there's a good chance that this voltage is being measured and then translated into a temperature and displayed. What makes the measurement of a thermovoltage possible is the Seebeck effect. So let's try to understand how the Seebeck effect comes about. Let's consider a metal rod in thermodynamic equilibrium. That means it has the same temperature everywhere along its length. That means that the electrons have the same velocity that move around in this uh, conductive rod. And so we should have a homogeneous distribution of electrons around the protons in the nuclei of the metal 
And of course these protons, they are stationary because the metal atoms are bonded together. So we have a crystal lattice that makes up this metal rod. But the electrons can move and we have an homogeneous distribution along the entire rod. Now we heat up one end of the rod and of course what happens is that the electrons have now a higher energy because they are hotter. And if you remember the energy basics chapter, hot means just more kinetic energy. So these electrons are faster than the electrons on the cold end. These are slow and lazy. And of course you can imagine these here now move ferociously around and so they apply a pressure on the, on the other end. They need more space and this means that here the electron density gets smaller while here the electron density increases. In other words, some of the electrons from the hot end move towards the cold end. Since the protons in the nuclei of the metal atoms are stationary, we end up with a positive charge on this end and a negative charge on this end. So this positive and negative charge that's similar to a capacitor and that is the thermal voltage that we get across the rod. It's interesting to note that this phenomenon occurs in all conductive materials, however at different strengths. And so we can say that the Seebeck effect is material specific in its strength, so it's a materials property. Okay, now we know how the thermal voltage comes about. If we want to make a current flow, then we need to close the circuit. And of course, to achieve that, we can bend the rod into a circle. This is what I show here, so we could also take a second rod of the same material and connect it to the, the first one. And so we could have a current flow around in this circuit. However, if the materials are the same and this end is hot and this end is cold, then we get the same charge redistribution in both of the materials. And that means that we get too many electrons on this end on, in both of the rods and positive charges, a lack of electrons on this end. And so it's pretty obvious that there is nothing that would make electrons flow around. So the trick in order to get a current flowing is to use two different materials. If we have a material with a different Seebeck effect and preferably one that has a reverse Seebeck effect, like shown here, that in one material electrons flee the cold side while in the other material they move away from the hot end, then we would have something that drives a current. Right, because we have too many electrons here, so they could hop down here where there are not enough. And here they would get pushed away, and then we would have too many electrons here, and they would be glad to go up here, because here we have a lack of electrons. So this would clearly make a current flow. The remaining question is, how can we find a pair of materials where one material has the regular Seebeck effect and the other material has the opposite Seebeck effect. N and P type semiconductors are such a pair of material. The N type semiconductor has the regular Seebeck effect because it has electrons that are mobile in the conduction band. And so if we heat up one end, it will turn positive because the electrons will move over towards the cold end and so we get a negative charge here. In the p-type semiconductor we have the reverse phenomenon. We have holes as charge carriers and therefore holes will move away from the hot ends because they have a higher kinetic energy. And that means that the hot end turns negative in a p-type semiconductor while the cold end turns positive. So if we connect both of these materials together at the ends, then we have a situation where we have negative charge at the cold end of the n-type semiconductor, so it will be glad to go over into the p-type semiconductor where there is a lack of electrons because we have all these positive charges. On the hot end, we have too many negative charges in the p-type semiconductor and these negative charges will be glad to go into the positively charged hot end of the n-type semiconductor. That means that we will have a current going around this circuit. Here you see a schematic of thermoelectric modules made with p and n-type semiconductors. 
On the right you see the power generation mode. In the power generation mode the load is connected between the ends of the semiconductors on the cold side and the other side is heated. And so we have a heat flow through the device and we get a resulting current that goes through the load. The electrons in the n-type material accumulate at the cold end and then they flow through the load to the p-type semiconductor cold end where they recombine with the holes that arrive on this side. So the electron current flows from right to left while the engineering current, it assumes positive charges for historical reasons, flows in the opposite direction. It's interesting to note that this device can be reverse operated. So if we provide the current with a power source, a battery, then the ends of the thermoelectric module will establish the same heat gradient that we had here in the power generation mode to generate this current. This can be used as a active cooling device. So we can put whatever we want to cool in contact with this end of the thermoelectric module and then heat will be absorbed and will be transported through the device and rejected on the formerly cold end. It should be pointed out that the efficiency in the power generation mode depends again like in all heat engines on the difference between the temperatures at the hot and the cold end. It is interesting to determine the output voltage of thermoelectric devices. The Seebeck coefficient can be calculated by dividing the voltage across the material in question divided by the temperature difference between the ends. And once we have the Seebeck coefficient, then we can calculate the output voltage. So if we have two materials in contact, like shown previously, all we have to do is subtract the Seebeck coefficients and multiply that with the temperature difference and then we have the voltage. Note that normal and opposite thermoelectric materials have Seebeck coefficients with a positive or negative sign. So if we subtract them and one is normal and the other one is opposite, they add up and this number gets larger. Here are some numbers for silicon and silicon germanium thermoelectric devices. The Seebeck coefficients are given here. Polysilicon, N-type and P-type, we have minus 57 and 103. This is millivolts per Kelvin. So you see they have opposite signs depending on the doping. For silicon germanium we get minus 77 and 59. If we calculate the combined Seebeck coefficient, if we make a device out of the N and P type materials, then we get 160 or 136 microvolts per Kelvin. So if we assume a delta T of 300 Kelvin across our thermoelectric generator, then we can calculate the output voltage. So 136 for the case of silicon germanium times 300 microvolts gives us 40.8 millivolts. That's a really small voltage. It's obvious that if we want useful voltages, we have to put many of these thermoelectric devices in series. A typical structure that is used to achieve this is something like this here where alternating N and P type legs are sandwiched between the heat sink and the high temperature reservoir and the N and P type legs are connected in this alternating mode. By doing so we have one thermocouple connected to the next one in series and so the voltage that the load sees that is the voltage accumulated across all the thermoelectric elements in this chain. Now let's explore the efficiency of thermoelectric generators. The efficiency depends on the figure of merit of the material that the generator is made from, or I should rather say the materials because there are always two in contact. So the graph shows us on the x-axis the figure of merit, ZT, and on the y-axis we have the theoretical efficiency relative to the maximum Carnot efficiency. The Carnot efficiency, that's the maximum efficiency a heat engine can achieve based on the difference uh, in temperatures between the hot and the cold reservoir. So here in this graph we assume that the hot uh, reservoir is 500 centigrades and the cold reservoir is at 30, so that gives us a difference here of 470. 
Now the figure of merit depends on the ratio between the electrical conductivity and the thermal conductivity. We hope for that the electrons move faster than the temperature is equilibrated along the device. And this is multiplied with the square of the Seebeck coefficient and multiplied with the temperature. This temperature, that is actually the median between the high and the low temperature of the device. Now when we consider the ZT of silicon germanium, which is one of the most popular materials right now for thermoelectric generators, that is 0 0.8. Now we can look up here, 0 0.8, that's about here, and then we go on to this curve, and so we end up here at about 25%. So 25% of 61%, that is about 15% at this 470 centigrade temperature differential. What's really being achieved is more of the order of 7 to 8%. So there are losses that are difficult to control right now. There's a lot of research going on that tries to achieve ZTs that are more between 2 and 3. There's a lot of materials research involved to find such materials that can, on one hand, take the heat and, on the other hand, have a good figure of merit. If one would achieve between 2 and 3, then devices of about 25% theoretical efficiency might become possible. Due to the need of a high temperature differential between the high and low temperature reservoirs and the overall fairly low efficiency of thermoelectric generators, their main use is currently found in space exploration where space probes that are far away from the sun need a reliable energy source and thermoelectric generators can fit that bill. Here you see the Cassini spacecraft with the attached Huygens probe. This spacecraft has three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTG. You see two of them up here, these lengthy structures that are bolted onto it. These units are powered by radioisotope heat sources where the natural radioactive decay is used as a heat source. Here you see a cutaway drawing of the thermoelectric generator. It's based on the general purpose heat source. The general purpose heat source are uh, boxes filled with uh, plutonium-238 and this generator has 18 of these uh, heat sources and they produce together a, a heat output of 4500 watts. The thermoelectric generator converted this into an electrical power output of 280 watts. This is the result of a temperature differential of 700 Kelvin. So on the inside here on the uh, heat sources, we have 1275 Kelvin. And on the heat fins that point towards space, the temperature was 575 Kelvin. So that gives us a differential of uh, 700 Kelvin. Now this power source degrades over time and they measured or estimated a degradation of 1.6% per year. The main reason for that is the isotopic decay of the plutonium. So as it decays, it is becoming less and less, and so the temperature is going down. There's also thermal damage to the thermocouples over time, which simply makes them less efficient. One can estimate the maximum voltage of this generator. We have 572 thermoelectric elements. Each of them we know has 136 microvolts per Kelvin. So if we calculate that with that 700K temperature differential, then we can calculate a maximum voltage of 54.5 volts of this generator. Here you see an exploded drawing of a single thermoelectric element of this generator. The most important parts are the P and N type slabs of silicon germanium that are connected to also N and P type doped uh, silicon molybdenum hot shoes. So this is where the, the uh, assembly connects to the general purpose heat source. And on the other end, uh, this is where the heat sinks are connected. This is a fairly massive thermocouple because if you calculate, we have about 280 watts uh, power output electrical and at 54 volts, that gives us an amperage of about five amps. So these slabs here need to be able to handle five amps. It's not entirely a sustainable energy topic, but it is interesting to have a brief look at the general purpose heat source. The heat, it was pointed out earlier, comes from plutonium-238 oxide fuel pellets that each uh, produce 62 watts of heat. 
the uh, total weight of plutonium oxide per generator uh, is 8 kilogram. Uh, the great thing about plutonium-238 is that it is a strong alpha radiation emitter, but it doesn't really emit much gamma or beta radiation. This makes it fairly safe because the only real danger comes from ingesting this material. And so if one can prevent that, this is a safe energy source. The power is uh, 0.5 watts per gram, so this is fairly significant. And the half-life time is 87.7 years. This gives it a fairly long lifetime in relation to the typical mission. So it's a good combination between power output, duration of operation, and safety aspects. Nonetheless, when this material is used in a satellite, of course, the, the main safety concern is that the satellite is lost during launch of the rocket, and so the plutonium pellets need to be protected against impact. And for this, the plutonium elements are embedded into a graphite shell, so this is what's seen here, and then these graphite shells with the plutonium pellets inside, they go inside a secondary structure, the aero shell, and all this together gives a solid protection against catastrophic impacts and prevents the plutonium from entering the environment. At the end of the thermoelectrics chapter, I would like to discuss a commercial thermoelectric element. This uh, element is designed for remote power applications. It costs $120 and one gets 19 watts peak. So that puts it at $6.30 per watt. Just for the module, here's an image of it mounted to a heat shield or something of that sort. So this is the, the hot end of the module and here we have a big heat sink. That's the cold end of the module. So again, the important part for operating any thermoelectric device is that we create a large uh, heat gradient between the hot end and the cold end. From their data sheet, I took this graph. This graph shows the current voltage curve of the device. So we have here the output voltage without current. If we don't connect a load, we have like 4.8 volts. And then as we draw more current, the voltage goes down and when we short circuit the device we get 15 amps out of it. So this uh, behavior means that we have a power maximum somewhere along this line where we have voltage and amps at a appreciable value. So if you plot a voltage times current then you get this green curve and on the right side y-axis we have the power of the device. And so you see that the maximum power is close to 20 watts. This also means that like a solar cell, a thermoelectric element needs to be ran at a perfect output current. This means that the load needs to be designed that we are at this current and this voltage. In the last few slides of this segment, I want to discuss feasibility of solar energy, in particular with a focus on the US. Here on this slide, you see a map of the US that shows the insulation per square meter and day in kilowatt hours. So we have kilowatt hours per square meter per day. And the color scale goes from more than nine kilowatt hours down to less than two kilowatt hours. As you would expect, the South has more sun, but pretty much the entire country has fairly high insulation values. In particular, of course, the southwest, there we have the highest. So this area is, as you know now, also the most interesting for concentrating solar because there's very little cloud cover, so the light is less diffuse and we have direct solar radiation on the solar panels. But the rest of the country also is pretty good for solar. In Tampa, we have maybe 5.5 kilowatt hours per square meter a day. That translates into a 230 watts per square meter power input over a day and night average. So if you consider a 20% efficient solar cell that we could put in the square meter, you could expect to get a power of about 40, 50 watts per square meter. Now that we know the average insulation of the US, we can examine how much of the area of the US would we have to use for solar cells if we wanted to attempt to cover the US total energy need. So we know that the US use about 290 petawatt hours per year. So if we divide that by 365, we get per day 80 terawatt hours. 
and of that 42% are being converted to work or useful heat. And so these 42% we would have to replace with electrical energy. 42% are 33.6 terawatt hours. And if we assume about a 20% loss to convert that into work, if they were electrical, then we can assume that we have about a need of electrical energy of 40 terawatt hours per day. So let's see how large a solar park we would have to build in Arizona or somewhere close in the desert areas if we wanted to get these 40 terawatt hours from solar energy. In the desert states we have 6.5 kilowatt hours per day and square meter on that uh, insulation scale and we can assume maybe a 5% total plant efficiency. We saw that even though we have 20% solar cells or solar panels, plants appear to be closer to 5 or even a little bit below efficiency because of all the infrastructure that has to surround the solar cells in order to make them work in a plant setting. We can calculate the total area needed, 40 terawatt hours divided by 6.5 kilowatt hours per square meter. So that's the number of square meters that we would need if we had a 100% efficient solar cell. But if we assume now the 5%, we need to multiply with 20 and that gives us 1.23 times 10 to the 11 square meters and you can do a little bit of math and calculate that this corresponds to an area of 220 by 220 square miles. Here on this map we have a scale so these are 200 miles so I drew a square that is about 220 by 220 square miles. It is obvious that this is a pretty large area that covers more than half of a state. Now in a realistic scenario there are many protected habitats, mountains, wildernesses, parks, populated areas and so the real plant area would be much larger, probably two to three times larger. Now, of course, this is not a very realistic scenario. Much more realistic would be to assume that the solar cells will be distributed all across the US and that many roofs of houses and areas that are already available will be used. But it is obvious that it would be a major effort to build up enough solar cells to cover the entire energy needs with solar energy. Area is of course only one part of the solar energy equation, cost certainly is another. We just estimated that we would need about 40 terawatt hours electrical per day to cover the energy needs of the United States. This corresponds to 1.7 terawatts averaged over the day generation capacity. If we allow for about 20% loss for transmission and storage, then we end up at about 2.1 terawatts that we would have to build up in uh, solar capacity. So when it comes to cost per watt, it has been established that the photovoltaic installation price goes down by about 7% per year. This study was conducted in 2010. So we see here the price per watt. This is a logarithmic scale. So this is 10 and one dollar. And this is 2010. So the curve goes from 1990 to 2030. So we're here with the data. So this is projection. Right now the price is about at two dollars. It seems reasonable that if we would implement the solar array to cover our energy needs over 20 years that we could maybe assume an average price of one dollar. And of course all this is just a very very rough estimation back of the envelope calculation to get an idea what the magnitude might be. But anyway let's let's assume one dollar per watt. This is per peak watt, of course. This is how solar cells are being rated. So if we assume this one dollar then for 2.1 terawatts, uh, we would need uh, 2.1 trillion dollars. Now this peak watt, of course, means that we need maybe three times more solar panels to really cover the energy need reliably. That brings us to about six trillion dollars. If we assume this to be invested over 20 years, that would cost 0.3 trillion per year. And of course, we completely leave out of the discussion here inflation and financing costs and, and all that. But I think it gives a good idea of the, the overall magnitude. 
An interesting consideration is that probably not all of these 0.3 trillion dollars per year would have to be funded with additional money because as solar gets phased in, fossil fuels would get phased out and so there would probably be significant savings in uh, fossil fuel needs which could compensate in part for these uh, costs to build up the photovoltaic industry. What do the 0.3 trillion dollars mean in comparison with the US economy? Well, the gross domestic product is 14.2 trillion per year. So it's obvious that the 0.3 trillion is a fairly uh, small fraction of that. Another interesting comparison is to compare these costs with the costs of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Uh, it can be estimated that the total final cost will run between four and six trillion dollars. So this is fairly similar to the uh, conversion cost that we just estimated. These costs, they were paid in part over the last 10 years and there are probably another 10 to 20 years over which they will occur. So this is actually a fairly similar expense and it appears that it was fairly easy for the American economy to shoulder these costs. So as bottom line, it appears that in terms of cost and space considerations, it is possible to convert the US to uh, photovoltaic electricity over a span of perhaps 20 years. So what about solar cell production? Here you see graphs about annual solar cell production in certain economic regions. And it is pretty obvious that there is an exponential upwards trend in pretty much all markets. These numbers here are megawatts. So to put this in perspective, the Chinese production in 2010 apparently here was about 11,000 megawatts. So this is 11 gigawatts. So that is the equivalent of 11 major coal-fired or nuclear power plants. So if this trend continues, it seems entirely feasible that the world uh, may develop enough solar capacity to at least cover significant parts of its electricity needs. This brings us to the summary of this segment. We learned that there are two main solar energy technologies, photovoltaics and solar thermal. When it comes to photovoltaics, we learned that there are single crystalline solar cells, usually made from silicon. Then there are thin film solar cells and concentrating photovoltaics. These are typically made with multi-layer cells. With solar thermal, there are parabolic trough, tower, and dish sterling solar thermal plants, where pa parabolic trough appears to be the most popular type. Then there is thermoelectric solar energy conversion. This is still an experimental or niche application technology. There we use semiconductor thermocouples and the Seebeck effect. When it comes to feasibility, it seems it is difficult to exceed 5% per plant area in conversion efficiency with today's technology. Land use would be of the order of one Western state if we wanted to completely cover the energy need of the United States. Cost would be substantial, but it seems not unfeasible. When it comes to challenges on the technological end, it's pretty obvious that the efficiency still needs to go up. 5% per plant area is not so great. So if we want to reduce land use for photovoltaics, then uh, we need to dramatically increase the efficiency. On the economic end, price reductions are necessary to make solar energy more competitive with existing energy technologies. And the biggest challenge is probably societal and political to make the right decisions that lead to the implementation of solar energy on a large scale. This concludes part three of the solar energy segment. Thanks for watching.